Hey church, we all have things we prioritize above almost everything in our lives. The dreams, desires, and obsessions that shape our decisions and aspirations. They are like gold statues that we hold dear. But here's the catch. What we value often reflects what we believe gives us the most value. We strive for trophies that seem to promise significance and fulfillment. But more often than not, we reach out and grasp that elusive prize only to discover it wasn't worth the time, money, or energy. When we become so preoccupied, those pursuits overshadow the better things that God has for us, it's time to reevaluate our priorities. How can we reshape our lives around a more fulfilling set of priorities, aligning our desires with God's priorities? Priorities. Join us this September as we uncover some of these answers in this new series, Tiny Gold Statues. What skewed priorities cost us and why it just isn't worth it. Throughout this series, we'll explore how to shift our focus, reevaluate our goals, and make room for what truly matters in our lives. So do me a favor, mark your calendars, and think of a friend that you can invite to our new series, Tiny Gold Statues, this September. It's not true. Now Laura's going to take it. Don't person. try to vote. We gotta save, save America. The No, hey, we're so glad that you're with us as we wrap up this series that we've been in uh, called Political Powder Keg, where we've been looking at uh, how do we avoid the political powder keg in our relationships, right? This idea that there's a way for you and I to navigate uh, politics and talking about politics without blowing up our relationships. And what we've learned is, uh, first and foremost, that we're called to live in Jesus's kingdom. Uh, even as we live here on earth, right? Pursuing unity despite our differences and not allowing our political preferences uh, to distract others from who Jesus is and what Jesus wants to do in and through their life. And we may agree with what we've learned or heard over the last few weeks, but if we're honest, uh, some of us still feel uh, discouraged, maybe sad and a little bit hopeless, right? Because maybe we're thinking, so we're just supposed to set us Aside our comfort and our preferences to be secondary, or maybe you feel we're just supposed to be kind to the people that are actively trying to take away uh, our freedoms, or we're supposed to just watch what we say so we don't offend others, right? All of that can feel like a whole lot of losing, and we don't like losing, especially willingly. And whether we're talking about our candidate or political party actually losing or the feeling that comes when uh, we choose to take up our cross, die to ourselves, and follow Jesus with our whole heart and our whole life, because there's a feeling of loss that can come with that, it can lead to us being hopeless. And that's what I want to talk about today. And if you're taking notes, the title of our message as we wrap up this series this week is, is it stupid to still have hope? Is it stupid to still have hope? Let me pray for us before we get into God's word. Jesus, we love you. We thank you for who you are. We thank you for what you've done and what you're doing. And God, we thank you for your word. Thank you that your word is a lamp into our feet, light into our path. I pray that's exactly what it would be for us today. And right where you are, whether you're in the room or joining us online, if you would pray this with me, God, if you speak, I'll listen. And God, we pray a special blessing over the Georgia Bulldogs and the Atlanta Falcons as they get ready to embark on another championship journey. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said amen. Even the Alabama fans said, amen. I'm kidding, I'm kidding, I'm kidding, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Uh, uh, one of the happiest moments in someone's life is their wedding day, right? And 
Uh, it's a moment that is supposed to be full of joy and happiness, and it's usually these like peak moments of joy uh, where we're able to remember very small details, um, even as we continue to move further and further away from that day, right? So I remember uh, the day that Tess and I got married, um, I can remember such vivid details about that day and these, and these just small things. Like one of the things is um, our day of coordinator forgot that we were doing communion at our wedding. And so we got married at this restaurant in Brooklyn and, um, and we needed bread. And so the restaurant, all they had was croissants. And so it was the best communion I've ever experienced <laughs> in my life. And so please don't send in like a thought of, hey, can we use croissants for communion? Please don't do that. Um, but it was amazing. Like, it was incredible. And, um, and then they had to run to a bodega to get grape juice. And, um, but it was one of those moments that I remember vividly. The other, maybe more notable thing that I remember is that Tess did not cry. And I was so disappointed. And uh, because I'm at the altar just like a sobbing mess. And she didn't cry at all. And in spite of her not crying, it still was a joyous day, right? And one that I will never forget. And, uh, but what's interesting is I've now gotten to be a part of many other weddings as an officiant. And one of the more interesting things is when I sit down with a couple and we talk through their ceremony and I ask them, I say, what do you want? This is your day. You tell me what you want and I will just do that. And uh, oftentimes what comes up is everyone references, they say the wedding passage, And it's so interesting. Like, I've heard it so many times. Oh, like, we'll probably have a reading, or if you can do a reading of the wedding passage. And I know what they're talking about, but some of these people, I'm like, do you know that it's a passage of the Bible? It's not a wedding passage. Like, God didn't write it and say, hey, here's the wedding passage. No, no, no. It's just a passage in the Bible. And maybe you're here, and you're, you're like, I think I might have heard what he's talking about in movies, and I didn't even know it was in the Bible, right? I'm going to start saying it, and some of you are going to be like, oh, my gosh, yeah, I know, I've heard that, right? It's love is patient, love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud, right? It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking, right? It's not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight uh, in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres, right? How many of us have heard that in a movie? Right? Okay, yeah, that's what I figured. How many of us have heard that at a wedding? Be read, right? How many of us, there's no judgment. How many of us didn't even know that was in the Bible? Yeah, that's okay. Like, I'm, not, I'm not shocked by that, right? Because here's what's happened. We've, as a culture, we've assigned a passage of the Bible as like, that's the wedding passage, right? And so the same way that there is a, there's been a passage that's been assigned to uh, one of the most joyous moments in our life, uh, there's also a passage, I think, for the darkest moment. And maybe you've experienced it being read at a funeral, or you've experienced it being read at a hospital bedside, or you've heard it recited uh, in a war movie. There's a part of it that you probably know from a rap song. Um, But that passage is Psalm 23, Psalm 23. And this passage might feel a little bit disconnected Uh, for us to be looking at in a series and a message on politics, but I do believe that there is truth in Psalm 23 that helps us with this feeling that we feel uh, of defeat and hopelessness, right? That maybe there is another way to navigate that feeling of hopelessness that can come in when it comes to the topic of politics and maybe even how we feel towards our country as a whole, all right? And so this is what Psalm 23 says. This is what David writes. He says, the Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever." And this is what David writes in Psalm 23, and oftentimes this passage is one that people turn to 
in a time where they feel hopeless and feel defeated, right? And I believe there, that David identifies three things that we all need that I think are helpful for us to understand and not necessarily to focus on the things that he identifies, but maybe for us to be reminded of the person who leads us to the things that we need. But I wanna dive a little bit deeper into each of those three things. The first thing, if you're taking notes, is this. We all need food. We all need food. Verse two, we read, he makes me lie down in green pastures. Now, when I imagine green pastures, what I think of is the golf course at Augusta National where they host the Masters Tournament every single year. I mean, there is not a more beautiful golf course in my opinion. The grass is perfect. The fairways look just beautiful. Even the rough, it seems soft. Greens are perfectly cut. All right, that's what I imagine, right? And if you could care less about golf, um, what you probably imagine is a field in Ireland, right, where the grass is tall and it's just lush and it's green, right? But I wanna help us understand that that is not what they experience in the wilderness in the Judean desert. It is not what David is referring to. He's not referring to these fields of just lush green grass. Really what he's speaking to is these little sprouts of green that pop up on the rocky hillside in the Judean wilderness. And I believe we have a picture just to help you understand what it actually looks like. If we can get that picture on the screen, this is really what he's referring to when it says green pastures. He says, he makes me lie down. Some of y'all are like, I don't wanna lay down in that, right? But here's what's happening. The job of a shepherd was to find these little pockets of grass sprouting up from the rocky hillside for the sheep to eat. And when we look at this, we can tell, some of you are like, man, if that's all we had to eat, that ain't enough for me, right? But for the sheep, it was just enough for today. And the sheep had to trust that the shepherd would be able to lead them to another little green pasture tomorrow so that they could eat. And so uh, for us, really for our kids, um, these little pockets of, of green grass for our kids are like the donut holes that they get here on ch at church on Sunday. And they spend their whole week, whole week dreaming about these donut holes. <laughs> they experience the rocky hillside of school and having to listen to their parents all so that their parents can lead them to that donut hole. I, I swear it's crazy. I don't know if I've ever been at a church where the kids, I mean, you, I, don't, I hope we're not putting anything in this. Um, but I mean, it's like the first thing, as soon as they step foot, don't, where's the donut holes? And if we don't have them, like, I feel bad for the parents because we've set you up for failure, right? But the same way, that as parents, we provide for our kids and our kids learn to trust that we will provide for them is the same way that a good shepherd can get his sheep to trust that even if we only have enough for today, I know that my shepherd will lead me to what I need as far as food for tomorrow. I know that he will lead me to another green pasture, even though the land in front of me looks desolate and dry. I know that my shepherd will lead me to what I need. And so do we trust that Jesus, our good shepherd, will not just give us what we need for today, but he'll give us what we need for tomorrow? even when the circumstances in our life look more like a rocky hillside, a desert dry and desolate, do we trust that he will lead us to what we need? The second thing that David identifies that we all need is drink. We all need drink, right? Verse two, it reads, he leads me beside still waters. And in verse five, David says, my cup overflows. Now, interesting is the most frequent cause of death in the wilderness isn't starvation, it isn't thirst. The most frequent cause of death is actually drowning. Why? Well, the limestone on the mountains cannot absorb the water, and so when it rains, 
all of the water just falls off of the mountain and goes into the valley and it creates these sudden and violent flash floods that really come out of nowhere. Right, and so the water rushes into the valley, but shortly after the flood, the valley becomes dry again, and there's a little bit of water uh, left on the bottom of the valley, and a wise shepherd understands the danger that's involved in trying to get his sheep to the water because he knows that his sheep needs to drink. He knows that the sheep needs water, but a wise shepherd understands the risk that's involved understands that I have to be careful even in the midst of chaos in getting my sheep to the water that I know it desperately needs. And so Jesus, who is our shepherd, can I tell you that in the midst of the chaos in our lives, in the midst of the uh, turmoil and confusion and chaos that can come, uh, that will come uh, next year during the election year, because it will come, it's not a matter of us avoiding it, right? It will come. He will lead us in the midst of all of that, through all of that, to what we need. But do we trust that he can do that? Do we trust that he can navigate just the utter chaos and mess that we have made of it all to get us to the thing that we desperately need? need, which is water. The Bible tells us that the well that we drink from in Christ is one of living water, that we would never thirst again. And do we trust that our shepherd can lead us to that water where we can quench our thirst safely? The third thing David identifies that we all need is hope. We all need hope. The most recognized portion of Psalm 23 may be made famous by Coolio. Uh, Verse four, it says, David says, even though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil for you are with me, your rod and your staff. They cover me. Some of you in the room like, who is Coolio? That's okay. That's okay. For thousands of years, People have found this verse, this verse in particular, to be comforting, right? It's a verse that allows us to feel whole again, even when it seems like everything is falling apart. And David paints a vision of what could be uh, the darkest moment in our life, and right? Maybe it's a uh, intense sickness, or it's a loss, or paralyzing fear, or even death itself. Yet in those times, and especially in those times, right? We can place our hope in God and reject the fear that seems to pursue us. It says, I fear no evil for your rod and staff, they comfort me. A shepherd's primary weapon is his rod. And with, the, with it, the shepherd fends off attackers, right, to ensure that his sheep can get through where they're trying to get through unhindered, right? And with it, the shepherd is able to protect its sheep. And a good shepherd knows how to use his rod, which is why David says, it's your rod that brings me comfort, even in the midst of what can be a difficult season and challenging season in my life, because David knows he's a good shepherd and he knows how to use his tools, right? The, a shepherd's tool to guide his sheep is his staff, right? With its crook, he pulls and pushes the sheep in the direction that he needs the sheep to go, what's best for the sheep, and also when the sheep is ready to go in the direction that he is calling the sheep to go. And what I love about this is uh, David then talks about how uh, God prepares a table for us in the presence of his enemies. And this is such a powerful image for 21st century Americans because uh, I think many of us, when we don't align with someone politically, we see them as the enemy. And whether we realize, realize it or not, that culture and news and media has uh, really perpetuated that idea in us uh, to see someone as an enemy. Uh, God says that he prepares a table, David says that God prepares a table for us in the presence of our enemies. And and what we have to understand, and maybe it's hard for us to understand present day, but back then, um, 
sitting at a table and partaking in a meal, the reason this imagery is so powerful is it's a sign of vulnerability, right? Think about it. You're choosing to sit down and eat and drink in front of your enemies. And so while your head is down in these donut holes, you are completely vulnerable to being attacked by your enemy. But what is so important for us to understand is that in our vulnerability, that we are actually strongest. Why? Not because of who we are or anything that we can do, but it's because of who we know is sitting at the table with us. And it's our shepherd who invited us to this table that he has prepared. Even in the presence of our enemies, we can sit down, we can fear no evil because we know who is with us and who is protecting us and who is providing for us. And though to the world this table may be a sign of weakness for us, it is a reminder of the eternal and everlasting hope that we have in and through the person of Jesus. And the reason Psalm 23 is surprisingly perfectly fitting for a message on politics is that it's so easy for you and I to speak of and think of others as the enemy. We seem to get completely lost in the mess that we have helped to make and we're not able to see a way out. And when we get overwhelmed by the political landscape in our country, and can I tell you, next year you will feel overwhelmed. It is inevitable. You will feel overwhelmed. And when you feel overwhelmed, you have a decision to make. Because anytime we feel overwhelmed, our mind and our body goes to its basic instincts, fight, flight, or freeze. That's what happens when we feel overwhelmed, either we try to fight, we, we run, or we freeze and we don't do anything and we become paralyzed by how overwhelmed we are. But I believe Psalm 23, David gives us a fourth option, and it's kind of the combination of when we sit at the table with our shepherd and he feeds us and he gives us water, and we are reminded of that this table represents the hope that we have in him, eternal and everlasting, it helps us see that there is a different way to navigate the minefield of politics in our world, and that fourth option that David gives us is faith. It's faith. It's faith. It's not fight, it's not flight, it's not freeze, but it's faith. And it's in these moments that it becomes important for you and I to remind ourselves, and if you're taking notes, you can write this down. We need to remind ourselves of whose we are so we can understand who we are and how we are to live. Can I tell you that maybe our greatest responsibility next year is not our initial expression politically or even belief politically, but our most important thing is how we will respond and how we react. That that determines our ability to be the people and the church that God has called us to be more than anything else. How are we gonna respond and how are we gonna react? From January 1, it's the end of November. And then, importantly, how are we going to respond and react for the next four years, irrespective of who wins, right? we got to remind ourselves of whose we are so we can understand who we are and how we are to live. And much like the flash floods in the Judean desert, we often get overwhelmed by our desires, our preferences, and our wants. And these things, uh, we become so hyper-focused on getting these things that they, they cause us to lose sight of everything else, including Jesus. And so Jesus has prepared an amazing table for us to remind us of who we are. Remind us of what he's provided for us and remind us of the faith that we can have, the kind of posture that we can have, even in a chaotic world. But yet we're so hyper-focused on our preferences and getting what we want that we completely miss out on the thing that Jesus has prepared for us. And I love, I love what Paul writes to the church in Colossians, reminding them that Jesus is 
is creating a new way for us to be human, right? That the things that once kept us divided are no longer relevant, right? And the things that, we, that used to take all of our attention are no longer worth pursuing. Look at what Colossians 3, one through three, it says this. It says, since then, you've been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is. Seated at the right hand of God, set your minds on things above, not on earthly things things. And can I tell you that politics is an earthly thing? There is no Democrat or Republican in heaven. There's no parties in heaven. The only party that we're having is one with Jesus. It says, set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. And the, the wording is so important for us to understand, right? Because he doesn't say Notice he doesn't say, hey, fix your behaviors on things above. He says, set your mind on things above. If you set your mind on things above, then how you live and how you behave will become what God wants of us. Because the way that we think controls what we do. He says, set your mind on things above, not on earthly things, for you died and your life is now hidden with Christ and God. And what happens is we strive so hard to make something of ourselves in this life, so much so that we use titles, roles, affiliations, and things to create uh, ourselves into who we want to be, but not maybe who God has called us to be. And this is hard because it starts from a young age, right? How many of us as kids got asked the question of what do you want to be when you grow up? How, how many times do we get asked that question over and over and over again, right? And I'm asking that question to my son, and I'm giving him the answer. NFL, MLB, <laughs> NBA, right? But notice that the response from our kids is never, you know, when I grow up, I want to be more like Jesus, Could you imagine if we taught our kids to focus on who they belong to more than what we want them to become, what we want them to do? Because all we're creating is that even when our kids have a relationship with Jesus, if we're only focused on teaching them what we want them to do, they're gonna end up focusing on doing more for God and they'll never learn how to just be with God when it's when we learn to be with God that it informs what we do for God, right? And so we use all of these titles, positions, affiliations to kind of make ourselves into who we want to be and politics falls into this as well. We overemphasize, right, uh, the importance of being in a position of power. We believe if the right person, party, or platform is at the top, they'll be able to solve the problems around us. Does that look true to you? Doesn't look true to me. It just seems like things are getting more and more challenging, regardless of who's at the top, regardless of who's in the office. And yet we believe the lie that it's in our politics that we can find the hope that we need. And while I believe in the power and the influence of politics, my prayer is that I never forget the one who is above it all. That I never forget the one who is the beginning and the end, the alpha and the omega, the one who has been given the name that is above every name. That Jesus, my Lord, is my shepherd. And because of him, I lack nothing. And because he is my shepherd, that even in, as I walk in the darkest valley, I don't have to be fearful because he is with me. And he is the only one who can give us an eternal and everlasting hope. And if you're taking notes, here's our big idea this week. The thing you are most devoted to will determine what you worry about the most. The thing that you are most devoted to will determine what you worry about the most. And my encouragement for you is as we get ready to head into what will be an interesting year, you can already start to feel it spinning, right? 
what are you most devoted to? And maybe for us, maybe the question that we should be asking is, who are you most devoted to? Right, if you find yourself most devoted to comfort, then you'll spend all your resources pursuing comfort. If it's power, you'll spend all your energy grasping at power. If it's security, then you'll spend all your energy trying to feel secure. But do we actually have control over those things? Can I tell you something you do have control over? Is what and who you are most devoted to. And regardless of what's happening in the world around me, May I never forget that the Lord is my shepherd. And as I place my hope in him, I can be confident that he will lead me to the food, water, and other things that I need to live the full life that he has for me. In fact, the only reason that any of us can be devoted to Jesus is because he was fully and still is fully devoted to us. Let that sink in for a moment. The only reason we can ever be devoted to Jesus is because he's fully devoted to us. Oswald Chambers, he wrote this as the worship team comes back to join me. He says this, faith never knows where it is being led, but it loves and knows the one who is leading. Faith never knows where it is being led, but it loves and knows the one who is leading. And if we can love and know the one who is leading us, that is Jesus, it will give us the ability to have faith regardless of what's happening in the world around us. And so am I placing my hope in a party, platform, or politician, or am I placing my hope in the one who I can be 100% confident will always lead me to the things that I need? We tend to read Psalm 23 at moments when all is lost, but what if we embrace Psalm 23 as a foundation to lift from rather than a last ditch effort of asking God to do something with our mess? What if we lived Psalm 23 out in each moment of our lives? Whether we find ourselves on the mountaintop or the valley, Psalm 23 still rings true. And maybe that becomes the most important thing that we pray every single day of next year is just reminding ourselves of who our good shepherd is. And so here's what we want you to ask yourself this week. Are there people, ideas, or things other than God that I have anchored my hope to? Are there people, ideas, or things other than God that I have anchored my hope to? Can I invite you to stand as I pray for us this morning? Jesus, we love you. We thank you for who you are. We thank you for what you've done and what you're doing. And we thank you that you are a good, wise, and faithful shepherd who knows exactly what we need and when we need it. And I pray that we would recognize the places in our heart, in our mind, in our lives where we have anchored our hope to something else and not you. And would you, out of your kindness, your grace, and your compassion for us, lead us ever so gently with your staff in the direction of placing our hope and anchoring our hope in all things to you. We love you. We bless you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said amen and amen. Hey, the worship team is going to take a moment and just sing over us. And as they sing over us about the goodness and the faithfulness of God, may it be what we need to just have the courage and the boldness to make sure that our hope in every area of our life is anchored to our good shepherd. Jesus. South Hills Church, I just want to take a moment and say thank you for watching our service online. Whether you're watching it for the first time or you're watching it again because you enjoyed the service so much from the weekend, I'd like to take a moment and dive into our giving. Every week we give people the opportunity to give back and give to the local church so that God can continue to bless your lives and bless your finances. Here at South Hills, we believe that everything comes from God. We believe that He's the one that chose us and brought us into this world, gave us our gifts 
and talents and abilities. And I just want you to know that when we give, we are giving back what God has already given to us. If you've ever seen any of our envelopes at a South Hills campus, you'll see on there that it says, every week at South Hills, your generosity is giving people the opportunity to live a better story. And there's a scripture on there in Matthew chapter 6, verse 21 that says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So I want to encourage you today to click down below and set up your giving, whether it's for the first time or whether you're doing reoccurring giving. We have four ways to give here at South Hills. One, you can do it in person at any of our campuses through an envelope. Or two, you can actually text any amount that you would like to, to 84321. And the third way is to download our Church Center app. I encourage you to do this one because the Church Center app gives you opportunity to stay connected with our church and your campuses. It's a great tool and resource for you to know what's going on. And the fourth way to give is to give online. You can go to southhills.org slash give, and you can set up your giving there. Whether you're a guest of our church or whether you are a member of our church, whether you simply just like to watch our services, I encourage you to trust God with your finances so that He can bless and anoint your finances and you can be trusting God in this journey of living life to the fullest. I love you and thank you for watching our online service today.